Hello. Hello. Good day, mate. Good day. How you doing, brother? I'm all right. Yourself? Pretty fantastic. Alive, yeah. you know. Nice. Still fat and sassy, loving life. Yeah, that's cool. Where you at? You're in Michigan, right? Yes, sir. Yourself? You're in Boston? Boston, Massachusetts. My second home. Third home. No, second home. Huh? Where's your first second home? home. Sydney, Australia. Okay. I didn't know if maybe, you know, you had several second homes or something. First homes, <laughs> first home, Sydney, Australia. Uh, I can't tell by the accent. Nah, mate. Hey, look, when someone, when I say like, oh, I'm going home, uh, I normally am referring to Sydney or Australia in general. So when you say I'm, I'm going, now you say I'm going to my second home? No, nah, you know what? I don't say that either. So okay. man, I'm just full of shit. <laughs> well, wait. I mean, sometimes we're like, yeah, we're going to go home for the night and we'll be at the convention and home yeah. means the hotel. The hotel. Yeah. So I guess okay. it's, uh, you know, wherever you lay your head, really. But yeah, Boston's kind of like my adopted home right now. Well, let, let me let me first introduce you and let's get to why you're in Boston. Um, yeah, because there's other places you could be, of course, but Boston seems to suit you. I'm guessing it's not yeah, just the muscles. No, that's it. <laughs> um, but Alakazam, Al, you already know. But welcome to the straight to the point, completely off topic. I guess I'm doing that backwards. I wasn't saying you already know. Welcome to this show. I actually was saying you already know who you are. You are a contortionist daredevil. Yeah, that's right. Performer. Yeah. And, and, extremely talented busker and now i'm looking at the awards here uh that yeah there's, had, there's had, a few of them <laughs> there's 20 years of it 20 years of uh of winning awards at busking yeah yeah i, I mean i started busking uh in the late 90s in like 96 and um you know i started getting invited to big events in like mm -hmm. you know the night late 90s like 99 2000 and uh, and and I for guess those I listening, huh? we're we're not talking about busing tables. This is busking. If you're not familiar with busking, could you give us a, a rundown of what it is? Well, it's uh, it's street performing, and you know when most people think of busking or street performing, uh, they might think of um, someone playing the guitar or someone singing, mm -hmm. or maybe break dancing. Um, you know, but what I do is uh, is a it's, it's called a circle show where you draw a crowd of a few hundred people all at once and you do a set show for like 30 minutes and mm -hmm. then you collect tips at the end and everyone leaves. So it's not like a, it's not like an ambient thing that you just do all day. You know, it's a, it's a set piece. Right. You gather a crowd, you do your show, you get them to pay you and then they leave. So That's I mean, Is that the most key people part? have seen something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certainly if you've been to Boston, New York, somewhere like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're in Boston now? That is, yeah. I mean, uh, when I was a young performer, um, the trick was to just go and try different cities. You know, like uh, one of my mates would say, hey, have you been to Melbourne yet? And Oh, i got to check out Melbourne. Have you been to Perth yet? No, i got to check out. And then you're in Perth and you meet someone from Canada. Oh, have you been to Vancouver yet? Oh, there's a great spot in Vancouver. Oh, i got to go check that out. And and as you go, you just kind of, um, you land where your show works best, you know? Mm -hmm. And for me, I got to Boston the first day, I uh, did a couple of great shows and I was like, wow, this is, this might be the best it's ever been for me, you know, um, as I, far as street performing goes and getting a big crowd and making good money. And I was like, okay, you, I guess I'm going to come here more often. <laughs> and made it your home. What what do you think was uh, the difference if you analyzed it? What do you see different from New York to Boston? Hmm. Um, New York uh, has its own. Every city, every country has its own style of performers, um, and I think the uh, the Australian style, uh, which is what I do, it's which is mm -hmm. like a very talky kind of act, uh, comedy, like dangerous stunts. Um, that's a very Australian style of busking. And uh, I think the New York style 
is uh it's it's like uh it's break dancing basically it's a group of Mm -hmm. a group of break dancers um you know doing their thing and in boston it's uh it was more um circus based you know so when i first came to boston it was a lot of jugglers and acrobats um and in new york it's hard to to basically to get a spot you know because the break dancers don't like to share um and there's like six of them you know so i want to share <laughs> well you're not sharing with us fuck off you know? right <laughs> like, right you know but I'll in follow. boston i show and up is it hard to overcome their music possibly too or not yeah i mean most uh most acts once they realize you're not a, a fuck off you know what i mean you're not like just a joke they'll work with you you know on the street mm. um so what i have had to do in america more than anywhere else is prove myself, you know? So if I show up somewhere and I want to work a spot and there's someone there already working it, um, they go, nah, nah, just go, go down the street, go here, go there. They always say, go somewhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. So the trick, the trick is to set up next to them and do a big show so they can't do their show, (laughs) you know, just to say, Hey, uh, I'm not a joke. Like, uh, isn't that stepping on their feet with me or you can work against me. (laughs) Okay. How 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 can you work with a a fellow busker? You take turns, you know. I I'll go <laughs> on, do my show, and then they'll go on, do their show, and then I'll go, you know, do my show, and then they'll have a break. You know what I mean? It's just like a little lineup. And yeah, if it's not so bad. Comes, you kind of yeah, want to break, great. anyways. You definitely want to break. You know, it takes a lot of energy to do a a street show like that. What about the the drummers, the drummer kids? Yeah, so, more in New Orleans. Are they in New York too? Yeah, they're in New York. They're in Boston. Um, that and shit looks like slave labor, though. <laughs> I see some. Does, does, there's always like New some, some like... eight year old kid that's beating out a fucking beat, and he doesn't even seem to be happy. And then uh, there's there's a pile of money next to him. And then at some point, some big adult will come by and be like, "No, no, man, next corner, man. This one's getting cold." Yeah. Well, I mean, I know a couple of great drummers. Um, Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's a couple of guys who work here in Boston and they work near us and we kind of, we, we figure it out, you know, like I'll do 30 minutes, they'll do 30 minutes and then someone else, a juggler will come out and then an acrobat will come out and then the drummer, you know what I mean? We just kind of work it out between us because if we all go on at the same time, it sucks for everyone. Right. But if you take turns and you, uh, just kind of humble and, and you don't want to just own the spot and not share um that's where you run into problems well that that i i would imagine it's funner for the audience yeah for real and a nice focused show for you and your your family you know um then it changes to another um style completely sometimes yeah yeah that's it you know and it's it's a nice variety um for people to see different things going on and uh, you know everyone's all anyone wants these days is uh, a 10 second video, you know, that they can say, Hey, look, I did this. Look what I yeah. saw. Look how cool <laughs> I am for seeing this. <laughs> you know, this guy has a, a propeller hat made out of, of Ginsu knives balancing <laughs> on top of a pogo stick 10 feet in the air or something. What? You know, you gotta, you gotta, uh, you gotta try and be original out, out there because, uh, there's so much sameness. I'm sure you see it in the tattoo industry as well. There's so much uh, sameness that you got to try and stand mm-hmm. out. And that's that's how I felt in the beginning as a performer. I was like, okay, everyone's doing this. Uh, how can I do something that works but stand out? You know, Was there different. many people doing an act? I've, I've never seen an act like yours. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> is there, is it, you go over to Australia, is everybody doing that? Uh, no, not everyone. I would say... Uh, uh, when I first started out, I saw uh, there was a there was a few tall unicycle acts. Um, mm-hmm. Everyone was juggling. Um, there was a couple of acrobats. Um, it was all circus based, you know. So I was like, okay, so I don't see one thing. I one thing I had up my sleeve was contortion, and I didn't see people doing that. Um, so after you know starting out with just a juggling show, I started doing a contortion as well and that's what really kind of separated me from the other performers uh that were around in sydney when i started out um and you know i would just uh i would see something 
in someone's show and be like, how that's great. How can I make that work for me? But it's mm-hmm. not the same thing. You know what I mean? So yeah, I still would see someone on really like a 10 foot unicycle and be like, how can I make that work for me? Well, the trick is uh, the thing that's good about it is that he's up really high and tons yeah. of people can see him, you know? So for me, it was like, okay, I got to get up really high. <laughs> so tons of people can see me. But now do you um, have to walk? What you usually you use is something it's, it's like, a, um, I don't know, a circus tent stake or, or, or spike the thing or something. I have, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's, it's called a Chinese circus pole. And, uh, okay. like there's, there's an old, the, you know, it's a, it's a traditional Chinese circus act, which I don't do. I basically just use the prop. <laughs> <laughs> well, you there's know? a whole part two to getting the crowd involved, uh, where they're actually supporting it. Oh uh, yeah. See, that's the thing. Uh, over time you learn who to choose, you know, I look at it. <laughs> that's what, that's what I was to ask is yeah. like, how do you put your hands in, in the safety of somebody in Boston? It's like, Oh shit, I'm supposed to meet somebody at the other corner and just drops the, the rope yeah. to the Chinese exactly. pool you're standing on. Well, um, I, I think now I do it unconsciously because I know what to look for. Um, but it used to be, um, sometimes you just pick the wrong person and you just learn the lesson, you know, like one time I picked a guy, uh, in Toronto, uh, who has been drinking. And at some point he did exactly that, just let go and, and left. And I was left like, Oh shit, I'm going to fall until one of my mates ran out and grabbed the rope, you know? Nice. Yeah. Um, good save. Yeah. Luckily he was there. Otherwise I would have come down. Yeah, um, it's it's supported in in four spots. It's a bowl with no no up no nothing else to stand it up. But yeah, I don't know. You're it's twelve, 12 to ten tall. feet in the air. It has a little okay. base. Has four ropes coming from the top, and I get people to hold the ropes. And uh, yeah, and one it, of them it, drops uh, it, you fall. <laughs> yeah, if this if one person drops, yeah, I'm gonna. The other three might be able to hold me up unless I'm already leaning that that way. Then I'm gonna go. But right. uh, yeah, so. The trick is these days I don't pick a, I don't pick a guy who's with a group of guys um, because you know groups of guys mm-hmm. hanging out together sometimes wouldn't do things that they would do if they were just by themselves. You know what I mean? Okay. They they won't try and look fun, like cool in front of their mates or or whatever it is. You mm-hmm. know, um, so I learned that early. Don't pick a guy from a group of guys. So I try and pick a dad. Someone's there with their kids or their wife doesn't want to look like a dick in public. You know, <laughs> I love the thought uh, that you put in into your, family. your, your stage craft. Yeah, yeah. So I've got an eye for choosing the right people. Uh, most of the time, you know, every now and then I'll pick someone and they'll stand up and walk up and I'll realize, Oh, this person's drunk or this person's got a disability. <laughs> you know what, what I mean? What do you it's do like, in shit. that case? Uh, well, I have to, I got to treat it really carefully um, and not really bring attention to it. But if, if I think someone's been drinking, I'll be like, are you drunk? I'm not letting you hold my rope. Pick it out of here. I'll just I make, feel make, like make I've seen you do that. That's why I ask. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen I'll people make, come I, up to you. Anything that like... happens, you've got to make it light. You've got to make it funny. You can't treat it seriously. You know what I mean? Um, and if like the, the instance where I, I have chosen someone who, who um you know has a disability or doesn't has an arm that doesn't work or something like that i'll just uh i'll get him up i'll get him a big round of applause i'll say you're gonna be my mascot you know you can hang out here and and show the audience what to do when when i need a round of applause you know what i mean like uh, <laughs> okay. i'll still i'll get him to do something else i'll just divert instead of holding the rope for me uh you're right. gonna just be my mascot <laughs> what I, I have you ever had to fire anybody while they're holding the rope when you're just like, yeah. Oh my God, that guy's drunk and it's dangerous. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> it, it happens from time to time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and for different reasons, but there's this one reason that stuck out over the summer. Um, I was in Canada and I was doing a street show and it was a hot day. Um, but it was the end of the day. And so there was shade and whatever. So I get out there, I'm doing my show. I pick four guys. I climb up on the pole and I keep having to adjust. I don't know if you've seen me when I'm up there. Sometimes yes. I have to ask someone to pull or whatever. And I yeah. kept having to ask the one guy on the front rope. The front rope is the most important rope, by the way. <laughs> <'Cause> that's <laughs> okay. the guy I can make eye contact with. Um, okay, yes. 
and falling so forwards be, or backwards. You're, you're more leaning back than you are falling forwards in most cases. Yeah, I'm trying to stay. I'm trying to stay like right in the middle, but okay. you know. Uh, anyway, so this guy wasn't making eye contact with me, and and he, I kept having to ask him to adjust, like pull. Oh, I too much to. Uh, and he was looking at the ground, and he was looking off at the crowd, and looking. I was just like, I said, "Mate, What's are you okay?" On? And he's huh? he said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 okay, I'm okay." And it kept going on. And eventually I just, I pointed at someone else in the crowd. I said, Hey mate, with the beard, come here for a sec. Can you stand in front of this guy and grab onto the rope? And he grabs onto the rope. And I said to the original guy, uh, Hey, let go and go and sit down, mate. I, I think, you know, I don't think you want to be here. <laughs> go sit down. And he was relieved, right? He left. And then yeah. later, uh, after my show was over, uh, he come up and, and I said, Hey, well, are you okay, mate? And he says, look, I was feeling faint. I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to pass out. And I was like, you should have told me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't well, he didn't want to look like crowd. that too. Yeah. He's already so, feeling it's, it's gotta be the, the eyes on him. The thing that yeah. you deal with and have no problem with at all. Yeah. How did that strike you when, cause aren't you thinking the same thing that he couldn't take the attention? No, I don't think it was that. I think maybe it was okay. just a hot day, you know, and he's up in front of the crowd, maybe not used to being in front of the crowd and, and he's, he's got to hold this up. thing. Otherwise I'm going to fall off, you know, just the pressure. And then since then I've been thinking about it. I'm like, geez, what if one of these guys passes out while I'm up here? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so that gets in the back of your mind. Um, Cause it's not, it's not a, um, it's not a safe trick. It's uh, it is dangerous. Um, but, uh, have you ever fallen then doing that I performance? I have not fallen. Off Just knock on some wood. I think, uh, it would be, you know, a game over situation. Um, either I fall the wrong way and I die instantly, uh, or I fall the wrong way and I break something. I'm not able to do it again, or I fall off. I hurt myself and then I don't want to do it again, you know, because <laughs> yeah. yeah. something bad happened. You know what I mean? So there's the three ways it could go, but uh, yeah, luckily for me, uh, everything's been okay so far. Well, I think it, it. I would imagine that has the credit that you to get the credit where the credit lies. I guess is probably right. your ability to communicate with so many people, keep their mm -hmm. attention, and um, and that's actually something we saw. So I'm doing a little research on you, and I saw that COVID got you in front of the camera. And yeah. you're, you're giving away all your busking secrets. Yeah. So, so basically like the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, uh, all right, I, I guess we're going to hang around and watch TV. And, uh, uh, I'm not really sure what to do. We're staying inside. We're not doing anything. Um, and I was like, well, what have I, what have I got to offer? So I was like, oh, maybe I'll go deliver groceries or I'll drive DoorDash or something like that, you know? And I did that mm -hmm. for a little while and I was like, I, you know, this sucks. Uh, <laughs> what, what have I got to offer if I'm not an entertainer? And, uh, and the thing is I have all this knowledge of how to be a great entertainer and how to be a great busker street performer. Um, so I just started, I, I started my own Facebook group um, called Tips for Street Performers. And I just started putting out videos of just things that I've learned that I, and techniques that I use in my show to obviously, A, to gather a crowd faster, to make the crowd stay and to make the crowd get bigger and to get them to pay you at the end. So there's all these. Very important part. Hundreds, there's hundreds of little techniques that I use in my show that I've never really articulated to people. And once I started saying them out loud, people were like, holy shit, man, this stuff is gold. I feel like, although I don't obviously street perform, I feel like I got something from it. Certainly, oh, yeah? if it's not just the enjoyment of watching a busker now, mm -hmm. do a, do some of the tricks. One of, I thought was genius. You said, if you're having a hard time getting the people to pack in, Sometimes you're standing up above everybody and, and people are coming in. You can see them watching the show, but they're like, I'm close enough. And they're probably going to try and walk off at some point. Too. Yeah. But then you said, but you do this genius part where after they don't come in, when you've already asked them, you kind of kneel down and get out of their sight line. 
Like, yeah, every I time you come back up, they're they're back crowded in now because they wanted to see whatever the rest of the people were seeing. Yeah, the thing is with busking, when you're when you first begin, you gather, you stop all these people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the trick is to to create a uh, a sense of exclusivity. So you gotta you gotta draw like a line on the ground and get everyone to crowd around you, so people behind the crowd can't see. And that makes that makes people fear of missing out. They go, "Well, what's going on over there? There's a mm -hmm. crowd." Um, and so that's that's a really key part of street performing is to is to create that barrier around you of people. Um, and and sometimes, yeah, they don't always all want to move. You know, like it, it's hard to make people do things. You know, because of free will. You know, I can ask, <laughs> yeah. and I can I can manipulate people uh, into doing it. Um, you know, uh, there's only a certain amount. You can only ask a couple of times before they go, no, nah, mate, I'm just going to stay here. Just fucking do your show. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, that's a little, a little technique I employ right at that moment when I ask everyone to move up. If I notice there's people that didn't uh, and, they, and they're and they not going to move up, instead of saying something to them, I'll just move out of their line of vision uh, so they can't see what I'm doing. Uh, and seems then they simple have and to, They have to kind of, they have to move in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's uh there's other parts too the um I've heard you explain I don't know if I watched the videos on it or you were just having conversation uh that I got to overhear between some mm -hmm. of the other performers but it was about getting the crowd to um to to stick around and to dig into their pockets a little bit and uh, yeah. and pay you for the entertainment they had. Well, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of psychology in that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, basically the whole show, you want to get the audience to say yes to you. You know, uh, hey, how about a round of applause? Yeah. Do you guys want to see this? Yeah. You just keep making them say yes, the whole show. And then at the end, you ask them to say yes to taking out their wallet and giving you money, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's, it, it, it it's, seems, it's, do you feel like a magician up there then at times? I sometimes feel like it's like, sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's like taking candy from a baby. Sometimes I'm like, Oh my God, I have this crowd so tight in the palm of my hand. <laughs> like I'm just going to milk them for their fucking wallets. You know what I mean? Um, I, 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 I feel, um, I, I feel like I do understand because I also, I now at the same time, I, I want to make sure we understand that you have given them something entertained them mm. excited them and that is why we're even alive so it isn't like without cause that you're getting money but at times you feel like a pied piper up there huh yeah and be like now everybody run off the fucking pier ha <laughs> <laughs> ha yeah it's uh it's it's very important to uh to ask in the right way you know like at the end of the show you kind of got to point out those things that you just mentioned you know point out hey look we had a good time out here right um mm. And, and at the end of the show, I'm going to be here collecting tips. And if you'd like to come up and put something in, a little bit of psychology, a um, little bit of background, and more more about why why you're performing. Like, oh, look, I do this because I love to be an entertainer in front of a crowd. Um, mm -hmm. And just hit them where, you know, they can relate, really connect with the crowd. And that that's really what, people, what gets people, uh, you know, pulling out the money. Yeah. And also enjoying it. I'm not, I don't think I'm wrong there. I don't think people yeah. spend that money that they spend to you in any way begrudgingly. Cause I see lines of people come up and give you and, and pay you yeah. pretty handsomely sometimes. And I imagine on well, the street, it might even be better sometimes. It is. It is definitely better on the street for tips um, than it is <laughs> inside a convention. Cause obviously people in a convention are paid to get in and yeah. didn't expect to see you or whatever, but out on the street, uh, yeah, they don't expect to see you either, but, <laughs> it just seems like, oh wow, I'm a part of culture. I'm doing this thing. I'm I'm hip. I've got I got the this I'm hanging out with this guy who's doing this great stuff, you know, and, and they yeah. feel like uh, a sense of uh re reciprocity. They they want to reward you and and there's something that I also do when I'm performing is uh I I try and make the crowd want to please me. Right? Instead of okay. instead of me trying to please them. Uh, you know, you see an entertainer. Oh, what about this trick? What about this trick? I kind of do the opposite. I try and get them to please me. So if they, 
if they'll, they'll do some round of applause, I'll be like, no, 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 that was terrible, folks. Uh, try uh-huh. again. I know you can do better, right? And then get <laughs> okay. do it again. And then so I keep doing that the entire show. And with the preface that at the end, they want to impress me with the amount of money that they're putting in my <laughs> bucket. I've seen you also get people to help you draw the crowd. You you seem to engage with the crowd or you'll talk more quietly to them um, yeah. at times and, and make them feel like they're special. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and like they want more community, like encourage them in or uh, I, I found it. No end of fascinating, like if you're out there at the tattoo convention anyway, sometimes the funnest stuff to do is people watch and then yeah. to see somebody who's who's kind of. I don't know. I feel like you've mastered people watching <laughs> of, <laughs> of sorts. Well, I, I've just like, I've just got all these years of experience, you know, and like mm-hmm. if someone walks up with a stroller, I've got a joke for that. If someone walks up as a couple, I've got a joke for that. If there's three guys hanging out together, I've got a joke for that, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so I just like shooting the shit with whatever kind of happens while I'm up there. Basically like being, mm-hmm. it's like fuel. It's like something happens or there's something there and, and there's, there's uh, an opportunity for me to be funny. You know, anything that happens is an opportunity to be, to be funny, no matter if it's a positive thing or a negative thing. It's all an opportunity. It's all fuel to try and be funny, which is, those, you know. Those ones where you have to ad lib with something going on, I imagine mm-hmm. that happens on the street more often as well. Do you, but yeah. do you find that those people feel as though they've shared in something even greater? now that there was this reaction yeah. the group took part in i think so you know like um, my show obviously has a, a set way that it goes every time mm-hmm. but there's all these things that happen um randomly when you're doing a street performance like there's a helicopter you know or there's an ambulance or there's a truck trying to go past your crowd or just or someone walks in and walks right through your show or, you know <laughs> right. what I mean? Like there's always something that happens and you can't get mad. You just got to make it funny. Like whatever it is, the ambulance shows up. You're like, good timing. I was just about to get up on the pole. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, yeah. So it's, <clears throat> that's all it's about is just taking anything and trying to make it funny. Good on you. Do you think that the accent is also a hit? I think it served me. I think it Mm -hmm. served me well in in America and in Canada. Just uh, you know, the ability to draw a crowd quickly with my voice. um, You know, being funny is one thing, but sounding different from everyone else—that's another thing. You know, it's like, oh, well, this guy—he's—he's from somewhere else. It's—it's a a little bit uh, of a novelty, right? Yeah, I won't say exotic. I'll say a novelty. (laughs) <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I, I, I avoided it, too. <laughs> I just didn't want to describe you as exotic. Yeah. Um, I'm not that exotic. You say it's hard to make people do things because of free will. But is that why one of your other uh, endeavor, th- one of your hobbies, then, is making them do things that you want with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm a BJJ guy. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, that, that all came about just because I... Uh, I lived near a jiu-jitsu gym, uh, like well, I was like eleven in years Boston? ago. Yeah, okay. yeah, in Boston, yeah, and uh, and I would drive past it every day, and I was into watching the fights. I was into watching the UFC, and I was watching you jiu-jitsu, and I was watching Muay Thai and all this stuff on on TV. <clears throat> and uh, I was at a point where I was looking for something um, physical to do, you know, because I never enjoyed, you know, going to the gym lifting weights, doing that kind of stuff, uh, which I do enjoy now. But back then, I just didn't have any interest in it. Um, and uh, and that, that was – I would drive past it every day. And, and one day, I, I decided to go. And uh, mm-hmm. that was it. I mean, I've been going to the same gym for 11 years now. And winning tourneys too, am I wrong? Uh, I don't win tournaments. No, no. <laughs> no? I've, okay. I've been to a few tournaments. Um but uh, yeah, I'm I'm not that I'm not dedicated enough um, to be a, a contender, you know, because I'm I'm more uh, focused on my my career as a performer, and it has me traveling a lot. And tournaments t- tend to happen on the weekend, and that's when I'm out doing my shows. Right. You know, so I've I've have done a few tournaments, um, um, but uh, you know, I'm 
like in the beginning, like on that first day, I'm in it for the fitness. You know, I want right. to, I want to, I want to stay fit as I get older. But what I've learned through jujitsu is that, uh, you know, it's you learn a lot of life lessons when you study martial arts. You know, like what you can handle in life, and 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 what what and how how much you can really take before you have to tap out. You know what I mean? Okay. And, uh, and about about getting, you know, ending and starting again, getting getting knocked down, getting back up, like that that kind of resiliency, um, really gets strengthened from doing martial arts. Have you done other martial arts? I did Wing Chun this- um, many years ago. Kung Fu. Um, and but for me, it was like. I was in Sydney and I did it while I was in Sydney, but then I go away for six months and I go touring and traveling and, and then, you know what I mean? You just kind of fall out of it. Um, yeah. Cause that, that was my, my life back then was living in Sydney and then going on tour for like six or seven months overseas. And there's everything about your life in Sydney, like everything about your life just gets like put on hold. And, um, so the good thing about living in Boston now is that I'm more, I'm more stationary, you know, and I can, I can do things like that, like year round. Right. Um, yeah. Cause obviously living in, in Australia and t- touring around the world, I couldn't hold on to a girlfriend. I rarely saw my family, you know, it was, it was really tough. And being here, like, uh, I'm, I'm with my wife most of the time, you know, unless I'm out doing a convention or doing a gig but I always go out and come back. I go out, I come back. You know, if the longest I go away from home is like two or three weeks, if I'm, you know, going to Europe or something, got a few gigs lined up. Does that mean that your, your day, anytime you want in Boston, I guess you could go out and busk a little. Am I wrong? Yeah. Any weekend I mean, at least. There's, there's weather permitting, you know, um, right, right now it's pretty chilly. Um, <laughs> but there's the odd day. If it's like, oh, it's a Saturday and it's over 50 degrees, which happened a couple of times in January, um, then you can do it. And there's people out because the weather's good. You know what I mean? Right. It's all very weather dependent. Um, so the, the the general season in Boston for busking is, you know, April through to uh, sometimes Thanksgiving. Um, right. Until it starts and, getting yeah, too so, cold. So I can, what? if I don't have a gig, I can go in and do street shows in Boston, which is great. How often do you do that? How often do you find uh, yourself Less and going less in? these days because um, I just get a lot more like outside, like paying kind of work. And then, but mm-hmm. if I have a weekend off, I would say probably one weekend a month, uh, I'm out there in Boston doing my street shows. I feel like it gives you a chance or it would give you a chance to sharpen up a little bit too. Is that because... It's more. It definitely ad-lived. helps you keep your edge for sure. Good. Um, yeah. If we're what's that? Oh, I did something here. Okay. <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Give me a, give me a second to pause so that I can get some air in there, and then Candy can find that to edit. All right. That should be good. Okay. Um, race walking. So other a- athletic things that I see you've done, you were originally a race walker when yeah. you were a kid. How old were you actually? I shouldn't say a kid, but how old were you race walking? doesn't seem like something a kid's. I was into. doing competitive uh, race walking when I was like probably 12 until, or maybe 11 through 16. Cause I had been doing um, track and field athletics mm-hmm. since I was like six or something and it was just too fast for you or something well uh (laughs) i did the uh i did the sprints i did all the track and field i did all the all the long distance running and then when i turned a certain age um they introduced the race walk and i just because i did all the events right um and and this one year they introduced the race walk and i did it and i was i was just had this natural technique like someone showed me how to do it and i could do it really easily um, cause of my, I don't know, my flexibility or whatever. Right. Um, and I saw I won the first day and then I started going to training. I learned how to, you know, be a faster walker. And then I started going to tournaments and competitions and meets and, and winning and all that. 
And uh, eventually, by the time I was like 14, 15, I was the kid to beat. Right. You know, I was uh, when I showed up, the other kids would be like, oh, shit, that guy's here, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> and uh, and that all went away when I learned how to juggle. Basically, I, you know, juggling took the place of of race, race walking. walking. But I used to I used to train in the same way because I learned how to train with doing the athletics, doing the race walking. Um, and so I knew how to train to get good at something. And, and that, that's kind of just got transferred to juggling. It's like, okay, this is what I have to do to be a good juggler. I saw, I saw you going over the, when you were race walking, you would train with menthol while you were training. Yeah. Or, and yeah. then you translated that to juggling and other parts of your act because the yeah. scent of that in your mouth uh, reawakens yeah. the strongest sense we have. It's tied to memory. I think, yes, yeah, scent and, and, and tasted, like, I think scent the most is definitely tied mm -hmm. to memory, you know, and that was a technique I learned when I was a kid and re even realized, but when I used to put on the, the icy hot, you know, the rub on the muscles and whatever yeah. at, at training, and then I'd put it on at the, the meat, I would feel, I would remember everything I learned in training. You know, and so it's like a memory trigger. And then so I started doing that with, with juggling and anything I do, I, I still do the same thing. You know, I feel I, like I, if, know, if there's anything that we do at home and there's nothing else we take away from this conversation, there is absolutely that, though. Like if you're learning anything new or you're learning anything, start using a little bit of menthol drops or even just bubble gum, I would imagine or something. Right. Right. Yeah. Anything that's the same. You know what I mean? Like like I, I, I prefer like the holes menthol drops uh right now <laughs> and uh any yes yeah, so i've been using those for years and whenever i'm i'm learning something i always have one whenever i'm performing i always have one um and it doesn't it just, get in the uh, way of the microphone work no nah, no nah, it just kind of sits okay. in the side of my mouth and yeah, yeah it's, it's it's weird it's a weird technique but it really works you know like i don't have to think about what i'm saying up on the mm -hmm. on the stage like i just it just comes it's genius uh, going back to race walking, that yeah. shit can be bad on your hips and knees. Am I wrong? You're 11 years old. Yeah, I don't think it was. I mean, I was doing okay. all kinds of long distance running as well and uh, okay. and sprints and, you know, shot put, discus, 400, 800, 1500, three kilometers. I was doing it all. So, uh, you know, it wasn't the only thing I was doing, um, but that was I the follow. only thing where I was competitive at. You know, mm -hmm. um, and that's that kind of transferred. Also, that transferred into my my street performing. You know, because I was I was really I was the best at something, and then I started street performing, and I wasn't the best at something. And I was like, okay, I need to I need to be the best at this. And uh, so I went. You know, I just did whatever I could do to make my show better and bigger, and gather a crowd more, and hold a bigger crowd, and just and that, all that was was. Um, going to different spots and adapting and learning. And, you know, it's like, it's like anything you learn. You just got to get different experiences from different people like jujitsu, like fighting five different size people uh, for, for a couple of days a week, you know, like after a while you realize that you can fight anyone. It's uh, a follow good yeah, feeling yeah. for you. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to say I can win against anyone, but, <laughs> <I> can <laughs> but you don't have anyone. to run away. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to speed walk away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, you know, my, my speed walking probably wouldn't help me out in a fight. But... <laughs> I was, uh, I've, I've been intrigued by that, but I did hear that, that it was, it was more painful on the knees, especially, and then the hips than just running. But, I think maybe for a regular person, but for someone who's like had added flexibility, it just didn't really bother me at all. Okay. You know? And that's, that's probably where you got most of your speed. Then you're, you got really flexible hips. Yeah. 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 I'm, I mean, I'm less flexible now than I used to be. Um, and I think the pandemic had something to do with that, you know, um, that jab. No, it was, it was just <laughs> not doing my show. Okay. You know, I spent years doing the same tricks, like at least, you know, eight, 10 times a week. And so then to so go, what you're saying is that's not really your wife's favorite uh, limber up <laughs> position. It doesn't get used yeah. as often as you say, huh? 
The spider push-ups? Nah. The spider push-ups, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think it was just not doing it. For, you know, the first the first shows I did after, like, basically I went to Florida at the end of 2020 just to, just to get my, my toe, my, dip my toes back in performing. Mm-hmm. And the first few shows I did, everything I did, hurt you know even though i warmed up and i was loose and ready all my all my contortion stuff hurt you know it's like shit okay i gotta i gotta evolve i gotta change with the times you know like uh, am i gonna go back and train this stuff up again stuff that i've already done for like 15 20 years already or am i just gonna move on and do something new and that was right that's right where i fell i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna lean towards lean into doing something new so you, you, it makes sense because at some point you got to lose mobility, right? It, yeah. Your your longevity is is largely dependent upon your your body. Yeah, and so these days I do tons of body work. You know, I do yoga, I do um um home kind of workouts like uh, like um what do they call them plyometrics. Um, okay. And. Uh, and you know, do jujitsu for my cardio, so I'm always doing something and trying to just stay strong. You know? Yeah, it was. Yeah, my my body is uh, definitely reliant. Uh, my show is reliant on my body. How long do you think this can go on? Then I don't really know. I mean, I've got I've got a lot of friends who are older who are performers, and they seem to be just fine. Um, Evolving their their axes, they can't exactly. Maybe do that's a... what happens, you know, like. <laughs> it said that uh you know in the beginning you know you start out when you're a, a teenager or 20 you start out when you're an entertainer you start out as a acrobat contortionist break dancer and then 30s and 40s you go into like uh something less strenuous like juggling and then mm-hmm. 50s you go into like magic and 60s puppetry <laughs> <laughs> it just gets it just gets easier and easier as you go eventually um, you're just a storyteller yeah exactly or when a you're comedian a, i guess storyteller. that's it um so See, that's that's generally how things go for entertainers i'm guessing then that that's somewhat necessity as they lose their uh mobility and stuff but there's also a large part of that I mean, because they could all get jobs at Walmart or something. A large part mm. of that is the love that you have of being with people, or is it being that's, the center? That's of it. That's all. Mm-hmm. That's that's you've, you hit the nail on the head, mate. It's just you just want to be in front of the crowd. Doesn't matter what you're doing. You just want to be with people and making them laugh and and having a good time. It's you haven't it's, thought about really being a pastor it, it then. A, a pastor? No. Yeah. I mean, if it was like a non-religious thing, but uh, I'm not into religion at all. Right on. Um, Seems but, to be uh, a good racket, and you're in. You're you're literally into rackets. <laughs> I mean, I'm inside them. Unintended. Yeah. 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 Which uh, I guess I should explain. One of the tricks you do is you fit through a squash racket, smaller than a tennis racket, and yes. then you fit through a tennis racket while the squash racket is somehow around you and you also decide to put a toilet on and go through that at some point right i go through the toilet seat yeah i go through the some train spotting kind of uh yeah okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah so those are all uh those are all in my like contortion um wheelhouse you know and those are the things that i still do now that aren't you know that aren't as strenuous as the contortion that i used to do um but i can still do them what was the stuff that was was uh harder for you Oh, years ago, I used to get inside a little box, uh, which was really difficult, and um, and I did a, a whole bunch of different contortion moves at the beginning of my show, um, and now it's yeah, basically the contortion section of my show is uh, is just the rackets and the toilet seat, you know, okay. and uh, <laughs> fitting through those and and just trying to make stupid jokes along the way. How excited were you to not have to lug the the box around anymore? Well, it was it was acting as a, a prop box as well, you know. I'd okay, all my props you in still there. had it, <laughs> right? Yeah. What What so about I, this pole? That itself seems like you have to walk. You you get on the subway with a with a twelve foot pole. Well, How, that's uh, that's been engineered, that? you know. That's been engineered, mm-hmm. so it um it all comes apart and fits inside the prop case. 
So it's it's not too hard, really. It's uh, nice. Over the years, I've kind of whittled down the amount of stuff I need for my show, and uh, mm-hmm. it all fits into one box, you know. But uh, yeah, that's that's one of the key things about being a street performer is you got to be mobile. Yeah, I, well, tattooing like my wife and I do. Boy, when we first started out, we had a whole. You know, we had to have a moving truck to get us to a tattoo convention. Right. And uh, now we can come on with a couple of, you know, um, one of those little personal item, rolly cart just, bags. Just carry bag. on? Yeah, pretty much just to carry on. Awesome. That's great. Pretty excited about it. I'm now lucky. I just have to stop carrying colored ink. Right, right. I'm lucky uh, that Troy is nice enough to have... Like he's he he lets me put my equipment on the trucks and and it just shows up at the next place, you know. Because I oh, have a yeah. duplicate, I have a duplicate kit that just kind of stays with Villain Arts, and I have another kit which is my A kit which is here at the house which I take to different gigs Slick. and that. But yeah, I've got a Villain Arts kit with all my stuff, and I just go backstage at the beginning and there it is, and go on stage and do my shows, and then at the end of the weekend I pack it all up and and then they load it onto the truck for me. Which is great. I'm so grateful for that because I've been I've been traveling with my kit for twenty something years, and it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> I think, what, what's it? Uh, it's usually another uh, luggage, at least if you're flying, right? Yeah, you yeah. Get well, oversized, uh, yeah. maybe even. It's like one or two bags that I have to check. So I have to go to the check-in line, and I have to check my bags. And sometimes they're overweight, and sometimes I have to pay. And you know, there's just Mm-hmm. A lot of different stress comes with bringing baggage on a plane. That and it often, doesn't show you know, up. You, yeah. You know, if you're just going on vacation or if I'm coming to a villain arts show, then I just have my carry on, which is great. But you can't just Europe, go buy another of those poles somewhere. No, nah, no. Nah, I mean, I've got one in Australia. I've got one here and I've got one now uh, with my villain arts kit. How and, often um, do you go back to Australia? I try and get down there once a year um, just to visit my family um, and, you know, basically just to see people. And sometimes I'll get I'll get some work while I'm there, you know, just to kind of uh, offset the costs. Um, yeah, like once a year. Right on. I'll yeah, it's a beautiful out. place. And I love I love to live in there. But um, there's just not a lot of opportunity for an entertainer. Um, the, I, okay, there's Is that a just bit, it's not as populated? I know Sydney's pretty populated. populated. Yeah, and, and and here there's so much more opportunity in the States. Was well, it that uh, the Australians, that you guys live with danger every day? Like there's a million things <laughs> that are trying to kill you, so they see you get up on a pole and they're like, oh, whatever. Exactly. It's not just that, but it's also okay. like, oh, you want me to pay you to do that? You know, like... I find I quote I quote a, a gig here and and they'll be like okay that's fine, but if I quote the same price in Australia they'd be like ah you gotta be fucking kidding me mate what about mates rates come on mate give me it's like <laughs> oh, Jesus. mates it's like, rates huh is that is that for all Australians or this was is it would be a friend of yours yeah friends you know but I'm sure okay. you get that a lot in the in the tattoo world as well just uh mm-hmm. you know people trying to hit you up for a cheaper a cheaper tattoo. <laughs> Yeah, and now they now they just and they they'll tell you now um without asking they'll tell you you're too expensive for them. <laughs> ah, they'll just mention right. it in, in conversation or something, and eventually yeah. you stop fighting with them. You're like you're just you're absolutely right. I don't even. Yeah. Because yeah. when I'm home, why don't I just take the time off? I'll enjoy that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. What is time yeah, off cool. for you? What do you do? Um. Well, I I I have. Uh, my house in Boston and uh, mm-hmm. I have but a couple of But you have the best job in the world too that you love and you I, I wonder could you be without it? Do you go to a vacation? Say you show up at Cozumel or some shit, all inclusive yeah. resort and you climb up on the closest light t- light pole and you start <laughs> busking. Nah, I can be without it. I, you know, not, not for a long period of time but I can take a vacation, no problem. I don't mind sitting on a beach reading a book. That's, that's great. Um, but when I'm home, I take care of my house I've got a couple of investment properties I take care of. Um, So I'm like a kind of a slash um, maintenance. Slumlord. Maintenance guy. Right on. Different word (laughs) for it. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I do my jujitsu, hang out with my local like buddies and talk, uh, talk street performing. And, um, how many yeah, man, you, uh, are most of the people life. you're hanging out with street performers as well then? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I only feel comfortable when I'm hanging out with other street performers. I, I've always felt like an outsider. Um, Basically, my whole life, <laughs> you know, even, when I was a kid in even school. Even in Australia. Yeah, even in Australia. I was a kid in school. Like, uh, I was never on the ends with the cool kids. And, um, you know, growing up, I don't feel at home drinking in bars or or even at family gatherings. I always feel like the the black sheep, you know, the outsider. And um, and I've always felt like that. And the only time I feel um, like normal is when I'm hanging mm-hmm. out with other street performers. You know, I walk into a tattoo I convention. I I completely feel like I'm out of my, you know, uh, out of my element. Even though I I have tattoos, I perform on the stage. You know, but uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a weird thing. You know, and there's probably some kind of psychological uh, explanation for it. Um, yeah, you're a freak, which brings I'm us to freak. your your freak original clothing line. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or at least I was looking for a segue at some point because not only yeah. are you a slumlord or um. <laughs> or as you called it, uh, property management, uh, probably better, <laughs> but you're also diversified as a fashion icon. Is that it? Oh, icon. I don't know about that. Uh, mogul, well, I, um, I, what, what, virtuoso you, you run in the freak clothing line down the runways anywhere. I'll accept virtuoso. Uh, virtuoso. Part of like maybe, it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, it all came about because, um, I, I get invited to a lot of, uh, like festivals uh for street performers basically there's there's street performers festivals all over the world and, and yeah i um, see that because you've won awards at all yeah, of them every fucking right. one of them <laughs> i'm looking at these awards right here but go on right. so um at these events you you're pretty much like a celebrity you know um mm-hmm. so it makes sense to have um gear like t-shirts and hats and stuff to to sell um, and so that's how that started, I, you know, back in like the early two thousands, I started selling t-shirts and I started selling bandanas and hats and all kinds of stuff at these, uh, events. And, um, and you know, it just kind of, that's how it went, you know, I'd always, um, make a little extra money because of that. And people would be wearing my stuff around and, and sitting in my show, wearing my, my merch, which is really cool. Uh, and sitting in other people's shows wearing my merch, which really throws the other performers off, you know? Well, yeah. They, they've do you, already do you, seen Alex do you ever Zan. see him oh, the man, next year? Now I got to do my show. Well, do you ever see him the next year when you go back? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I definitely see my old merch uh, showing up in my crowd from time to time. Uh, it feels I try like and, it would I try be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. I try and keep it feels it, like uh, it'd be fresh. cool to see him walking around the streets somewhere that you hadn't been right like you just saw it show yeah. up and you're like whoa that actually happened last year uh, i just did kansas city tattoo convention and mm-hmm. uh and someone there i had bought one of my hats uh and gave it to his girlfriend and the next week i was in a different place in kansas doing a festival and then i walk into this bar and there's a girl wearing my freak hat and I was like, hey, you must have been at the convention last weekend. She's like, uh, what? <laughs> this weird guy, said, oh, this that's weird my Australian hat. tried says, to hit on What do you mean me? that's your hat? I said, I, that, that's one of my merchandise hats. That's one of my hats. And uh, she goes, oh, my boyfriend gave me this. He was at the convention last week. I was like, ah, okay, so you went there. Uh, normally when you see someone wearing one of my hats. Yeah, they they've seen the show. If I say hello to them, they'll be like, oh, my God, it's you. You know, but this lady had no idea who I was. <laughs> or else she gangstered it. She might have just stole it. Yeah, that's possible. It's come yeah. up and five finger discount it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's how that came about. So I I was at the <laughs> conventions. You know, I always had my my Alakazam hats uh, after my shows. And it um, says "Freak" right on it. Freak, right? yeah, Freak original. Do you right have on one that says now? <laughs> but this, so this girl's showing up to the bar. <laughs> Yeah. Wearing the freak original hat. Yeah. Uh, awesome. <laughs> there was a boyfriend <laughs> there that weekend. He he wasn't there to say hi. Oh, it's Alakazam. No. I bought this hat. Yeah, yeah, no. He wasn't there. Right on. Dirty girl. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, well, when I when I would come to uh, a convention, um, I'm only performing four times over three days. 
so I have a lot of spare time, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'd be hanging around the booths, other, you know, talking to you, talking to other tattoo artists, talk, talking to other performers. I'd go out for lunch, whatever. But I feel like I was just wasting a lot of time um, while I was away from home. And I was like, well, how can I turn my time away from home into I'm actually working, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I asked Troy if I could have a booth. Um, and he, uh, he said, yeah, sure. You know, and I, so I started printing all kinds of shirts and hats and ho- hoodies and tank tops and that. And, and, um, and that was, that was the birth of, uh, the freak brand. Uh, and that was like 2018. I think I started doing that. Can we um, get it online or is it only yeah. through your Yeah. Hands? Freakoriginal.com. Nice. So I've still got the, uh, still got the online store, but I don't, I don't bring my, my, my booth anymore, um, to the convention. So it was basically, I did it for like a year and a half and then the pandemic. And then, and then I did a few more conventions and I was just, I'd had enough. I was, t- I was tired of sitting there all day. Like I, I know, <laughs> like as an artist, you probably, you sit there, you do a tattoo, you could take a break and, you know, um, you do another tattoo, but as a, as a vendor, you just got to sit there all <laughs> fucking day you know and i just it wasn't in me uh and, right. and also like selling my stuff to someone that didn't just watch my show felt weird you know like i've always just had people come up and buy my stuff right off you know because i yeah. did the show and then trying to sell it to someone who'd never seen it before never done i have no idea who i am it was just weird i just felt weird and it just what didn't about really feel the like online my sales you, your online, online sales, sales facilitate the same thing yeah exactly yeah so i haven't really uh you know I, there was a period where it was working um but i mm-hmm. haven't pushed it very much lately and i'm honestly i i've kind of fallen out of out of love with it um well i hope people but, uh, buy these shirts there. on it listening and just to make you feel nervous they'll go to your show and just show up with a freak sh- and not even uh you know be yeah. aware of what they're wearing that's it. I mean, everything on the on the website's discounted right now, so you can get your freak gear real cheap. Oh, nice! <laughs> and then hopefully make you feel uncomfortable in the subways of Boston. Exactly. Yeah. Just show <laughs> because up. They have no pictures. idea what you even look like. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, what happens in the future then? You're already talking about being diversified some, but we recognize that, you, I mean, are you starting card tricks or anything yet? Um, I I've, I used to do card tricks back when I was a young bloke. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I, I want to be a performer as long as I can be. Um, but honestly, mate, I'll tell you this in confidence, but it's probably going to get, um, you know. Yeah, we're recording. Sh- shot out to the world at some point. <laughs> Uh, I want to be in in the tattoo industry. You want to do tattoos? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Fucking so I, awesome. I, yeah. Oh, that's cool. You're the first person I've told other than my wife. <laughs> really? Well, fuck. I mean, yeah, you're well, in the right spot to, you, you got a lot of friends that are happy to help you with the information. Right. Um, you're, you're already traveling, you know, so you, you, you see how and you already know how to bring a crowd in. I feel like it's an easy, I mean, I don't know what your, your hand stability is like. Well, here's the um, thing. Um, mm-hmm. I've been doing art and design and drawing like my whole life. And it, it's never, I've never thought about it as anything other than, Hey, this skill helps me promote my show because I can make all my own mm-hmm. artwork. I can, I can design all my own banners <laughs> and I can do all this stuff. Um, and it was Enigma who originally planted the seed because he was doing, he was doing his, um, his tattoos, uh, with the puzzle pieces. Puzzle at all piece, the yeah. And the he Enigma kept world's me. He's like, Guinness, you he's a sideshow performer as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know if I have the time. I've got so much going on with my, with my performing, you know, and, um, and, you know, just over the years, uh, as things have, uh, you know, I've been at the conventions more. I see the work that people are doing. I'm just really inspired by it. Awesome. And um, and so I've been drawing my ass off, and uh, I've been tracing my ass off just to get all those, you know, all those skills that I have had my whole life, like just together to to be actually um, something that I can use for tattooing. Is there a style that you're drawn to more than another? 
uh when i look on instagram i really like um like the the just the black stuff you know like all those black designs the Good black on, lines yeah. and the zigzags and all that stuff like the, um, the geometric like, type stuff like calkins is doing and and uh, i like that stuff i like that stuff yeah um uh, but you mean just bold black kind of like what you wear yeah yeah like not just like a whole you know black sleeve you know but uh, all the black work the black ink stuff um uh there's this guy gerhard weisbeck um from europe somewhere i look a lot of his stuff just those like nice black designs but um there's 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 tons of things i like um you know but i definitely like black work uh and i don't really know what it is for me yet because you know you 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 find your style over time right and yeah as a as an entertainer you know when you start performing you you basically mimic what you see and then you add your own flavor and it becomes something new and i see that um with tattooing too being able to use that in tattooing as well mimic what you see add your own flavor add your own style and it becomes your thing um so that's that's what i'm looking at and right now i basically you know I'm, i'm 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 tracing a whole bunch um and i'm drawing a whole bunch and that's all i'm doing right now just to get the uh the stability and the line work good you know i started with a big pen and then i'm working with smaller pens and smaller and smaller and just getting mm-hmm. steadier and steadier and just <laughs> what about know, uh, playing... machines have you messed around with them yet no not yet no uh but i've been wanting to talk to you and other tattoo artists about different uh different machines that they use um you know i know a lot of people use the uh the pen machines now which really um i like that idea because of the battery and the no cable and all that it's Um, much easier to travel for sure yeah yeah and a lot of them are running really good line work you see some of the crispest stuff coming out with um that flux runs really nice line work i'm a big fan of this numa Mm -hmm. the uh fk irons flux i believe it is oh fk irons okay Uh, it's a pen and then yeah. there's the uh the the numa i'm a big fan of but i started out using coil machines and the no- numas yeah. it hits more like a coil machine so there yeah. might be for someone just coming new to it it might not have the same kind of uh oh i like this you know mm-hmm. <laughs> that that i have with it um but yeah, I, yeah. I mean that's all for a different time i look forward to it, it seems like all our friends are getting to it rob uh and and electra uh, yeah, the work with villain arts are both getting into drawing as well. And uh, yeah. Cody, uh, down there in Florida, he just started working with Tyler Nolan, uh, learning mm. how to tattoo. Um, Tyler's cool, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and Cody, I think you know too, he used to travel with the t shirt guys with the dreadlocks. I feel okay. like he's got a grill or something, yeah, uh, right, right, right. Nice. Everybody's everybody wants my job apparently, so nice. that's why I'm doing that's why I'm doing podcasts. I think it's just like <laughs> it just it feels like a natural place for me to go. You know, like my whole my whole life, I've never really planned where my where what what I was going to do with my career. Things just kind of happened, and I th- I feel like this has just kind of happened as well. You know, like one of my friends started tattooing um, just like just over a year ago. Um, Jeremy Jones, you know, Jeremy Jones, he was, um, think so. he used to sell, he used to sell, um, jewelry at the conventions with his wife, Johanna. It sounds familiar. I, I, uh, was it mostly wooden jewelry? Like, um, or, or was oh, it? Oh, no, uh, he had all kinds of stuff. The hot rod um, stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, anyway, he's from, he's from Florida. He's one of my buddies. Cause we, we, we used to hang out a lot at the conventions and, and he learned, uh, he, he tattoo apprentice with, um, Robbie ripple at um Raddy. okay yeah. and um so jeremy's been kind of helping me out in the beginning he's like yeah just got to trace your ass off you got to get these pens you got to get this paper you got to do this you got to do this here's a bunch of youtube videos uh here's some channels you should be watching um da, 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 da. and um yeah i'm just i'm just i'm just kind of asking for help from from different um you know because you guys you guys are the best in the country and I'm surrounded by you guys. That's what we keep telling ourselves. Great. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell people too, you know, like, oh, what what happens at the tattoo convention? I say, all the best tattooists in the country are here in your city right now. 
So yeah. if you want to get a really good tattoo, come to the convention. Um, Makes it easy so that, to stay humble because it's it is the truth. There's always somebody there that's better than you, even if you're the best. There's somebody there better. I don't know how that can yeah. work, but it happens. I'm I'm totally cool with that because that's how I feel about uh, performing. That's how I feel about jujitsu. Uh, there's I, I I've always got um, room in my brain for more learning, you know, or more inspiration. Mm -hmm. Being inspired, uh, seeing something that's done better than had the way I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Like. So I'm totally open and humble when it comes to all that. And jujitsu made me completely ego free. I tell you what. How's that? Because you, know, you got well, beat up enough, or? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. you, you, you can't have an ego with uh, you can't have an ego with martial arts, man. Because there's always someone better. You know, in performing, um, street performing. Uh, you know, when I was a young bloke. I definitely had, I used to, uh, you know, just rib people, other performers and, you know, break, break, break people's balls. And, you know, you were a little bit of, hot, of I uh, came from a dick, hot shot kind from, of maverick or I was a hot shot. Yeah, for real. And, but that's the culture I came from, you know, right. that's the way I was taught is that that's how the, that's how the other performers treated me, you know? So <laughs> when I got to be like the top of the pile, that's how I treated other performers as well. Um, right. And that, that I don't do that anymore. Now all I want to do is help um, performers. So that's, that's completely gone now. And I think, yeah, being a martial artist really helped with that just because it doesn't matter how good you are. There's always someone better. Just like you say right. about tattooing. <laughs> well, you, you say you want to help other performers and you did that one with your videos you also were yeah. doing podcasts that, that we were able to listen to where you were able to um you're, you're a part of a podcasting community of sorts right where you just catch yeah other legendary street performers and you're like holy shit i can't believe i'm in the same town with this guy let's sit down so, get some microphones and ask the some thing questions. is about the thing is about the street performing world is that uh people don't know about it and there's this whole subculture of performers and all the street performers, we all know about all these guys and we've heard about and we all have performed alongside all mm -hmm. these people. Um, but the general public would have no idea. Like you, you talk about like a, a legendary tattooer and, you know, the yeah, general most public people don't like, know Who? about Jack Rudy. Exactly. And the, I'll, I'll say the same thing. Like, oh, I'll, I'll say, you know, oh, have you ever seen Gaza? Have you ever seen Nick Nicholas? You'd be like, Who? But those are like the, those are the biggest names when I first started, you know what I mean? Right. And, uh, and they're legendary and there's so many legendary acts out there. Uh, and I've moved into a generation where I'm one of those legendary acts that the new performers talk about, which is cool for me because I show up places and people know who I am. You know, I show up at a, at a performing spot and a performer will know exactly who I am. And I'll be like, oh, do you get, cool, man. do you get performer groupies too? Um, I used to before I was okay. like, I'd say under, <laughs> under I'd say before age. I turned like 35, uh, that used to happen a lot. Um, we're missing in my twenties for sure. Like it was, it was super. They had a folk convention. I believe it was, it might not have been Minneapolis, it might've been like Chicago, but there was a folk musician like convention yeah. going on too. And there was some dude there named like Floby or something. <laughs> And like yeah. I heard people talking about him in the elevator. Oh my God, let's talk to Floby. Wow, that's cool. He's going to be putting a set on later on. <laughs> and in dulcet tones, you know, how how you can imagine that the NPR listening audience would would be. And uh, yeah. then later I met Floby or whoever, and he had his wife there with him. And they were riding the elevator with us. And he had a young a uh, folk musician that was expressing a problem that in the very brief ride, I caught a lot of subtext. One, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, the wife of Floby was grabbing on his arm. Like she had something valuable. Floby. Mm. Meanwhile, I mean, he's wearing like a members only jacket. He's a, uh, he's balding, but he's got like long hair, you know, like, um, yeah. like he's still trying to hold on to it. Uh, he's wearing just some comfortable loafers and some mm -hmm. like dockers, you know, just uh, just real casual. Uh, nothing that you would really think you're going to write home about. But meanwhile, his wife's grabbing hold of his arm because she's kind of 
stake in her claim because this younger folk singer is talking about how she has an obsessed fan who's who's a patreon subscriber Mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to lose the income but she's getting to the point where she's gonna have to tell him i'm not gonna fuck you um (laughs) that's a bit of i may be reading a bit too much and it was a nice little context though because you're like wow this folk singer at like 85 whatever old he is he's still got he's still Mm -hmm. got groupies Got swagger. Got, yeah. Yeah. yeah he's got uh, swagger uh, like Jagger. It just happens rarer than it used to. It used to be, um, you know, after my street show, uh, I would just look around and someone would be waiting for me, you know, <laughs> and that used to happen all the time. And uh, now it happens like, I don't know, maybe six times a year. <laughs> you know, they're always all excited. Right on. They're always my age or older. It used, used to be like my age or younger. Now it's my age or older um yeah right but on. um yeah back back about the um the podcast so there's all these legends of street performing out there and um and that's that was the idea is to get their story um uh, before they're dead you know get, just get it like a like a history of street performing recorded you know because um otherwise no one else is really keeping no it. one would ever know about it something that's so valuable and and, and big to yourself then uh many i feel like that in uh, tattooing really too as we watch you know some of these icons to us um yeah pass away shanghai kate went recently and she before she was able to make a book uh you know sailor jerry philadelphia eddie all these people that have started and are part of the history of tattooing, but some of their story is missing. So, yeah, unless, unless we celebrate it, I appreciate to hear that you're doing that for your community there. Um, but it also, uh, because of your podcasting abilities, it makes it easier for me to ask you to ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got Put me on the hot seat. For you. Is that okay? Oh yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You're prepared then. Yeah, because uh, I was told that you do uh, this question thing at the end. Um, so I said, hey, look, is it okay if I ask 10 questions? <laughs> Absolutely. What what you got? Okay, the first one is, uh, what are the most common mistakes you see beginner tattooers make? Oh, I see where you're going with this one now, now that we know yeah. you're tattooing. A well, not free yet, information, but huh? I want to learn. <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the biggest mistakes tattoo artists make is trying to be versatile at everything. Uh mm-hmm that's with their career though I, I would say when you're first starting out it isn't bad and you certainly want to take the home ec class as well as the shop and woodworking to find out if maybe it's your thing you know mm-hmm. but i wouldn't spend too long on something that you've determined isn't your thing anymore because mm-hmm. at the end you're trying to carve out um a career and that's going to be better served by a specialization than it mm-hmm. is by being everything right so you're talking about tattoo styles like focusing mm-hmm. on one style yeah yep i feel like a lot of times people it, there's an admiration to somebody who can do everything mm-hmm. but i don't i haven't seen it pay off in like this large success you know you mm-hmm. might be busy and you might be able to work but we got you know you don't get a a pension you know you, yeah so of you're going to need to make some kind of a unique impression upon people. And if you're Mm -hmm. busy being everybody else, then you're never going to be set up as being you. Right. That makes any sense. So, uh, so uh, make sure you're in a niche. That's what you're saying. Be original. I mean, do you make sure you do you yeah you know i mean don't and i guess that comes down to to the other part is a lot of times we lose our no we we and i still do this to the to this day i need to say no mm-hmm. and some of the artists that have been the best about saying no to their clients about something they know will not look right mm-hmm. leaves them with a better portfolio than somebody yeah. who's like you know, I, I didn't take a picture of the top because she made me put a fucking phrase up there. But mm. look at this landscape I was able to do. Except for the <laughs> yeah. compromise that, you know, I didn't say no about. Yeah. Uh, it's specialize. awesome. Yeah. So specialize. Okay. Cool. That's exactly and, well, awesome. and, and be prepared to say no. Whereas you have 
education, you can share it. You, you, hopefully you can share it with your client. And, uh, right. But Change sometimes, mind a bit. well, yeah, you'll tell them shit. And I've been getting this lately and they just look right at you like, okay, yeah, but you can do it. And you're like, yeah, but what I'm telling you is I can do it, but it's not going to be as impressive. It's going to take longer and we won't be able to get, get it done with other parts of the statue, but you can do yeah. it. Yeah. You're like, right. Well, this I, is no, I should have just said, no, I can't do it. <laughs> I won't yeah. have that in my portfolio. Yeah, understood. All right. Anyway. Second question. Uh, what problems does every tattooer run into? Um, shaky line weight? I don't know. What does every tattooer run into? No, I wouldn't yeah. say in like tattooing, um, the, the practice of tattooing. I mean, as a tattooer. Right. Uh, What's the problem that, you, that every tattoo will run, run into? the opportunity to fuck your, your mentors over. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing that, that you do, especially young on, is you put value on people based on their ability as opposed to based on them just being a person. And yeah. so once you've already learned what you can learn from one person, a lot of these young youngsters don't, uh, th they go on to learn from the next person and they kind of mm -hmm. throw away the old. You know, what I mean, like, ah, it was stagnating me. I couldn't, I couldn't mm. be there because I had to move forward. And it's like, well, you kind of, it would have been nice that you, that you recognize this guy, recognize something in you mm. and gave you the foot in the door. And then maybe you pay him back, even though you still mm -hmm. need to learn. No one says you don't learn, but it doesn't mean that you don't reciprocate, you know? Mm. So I, I think, think I every have, artist like, has an opportunity to fuck over their boss at some point <laughs> and you shouldn't it yeah. will better serve you in the future. Cause you'll also be in that situation where now you're a boss yeah. and you're like, you know, here's this thing that happens. Um, tipping, you know, mm. tipping fine and good. And thank you for the extra money on top of it. I never acquire a tip. I never do a tattoo for a tip. I'm glad yeah. when they, and I appreciate any amount of money for it however sometimes somebody will lean into you not knowing that you're the boss and they'll uh say man i usually get tattooed by i'm just making up a name here you know i, I usually mm -hmm. get tattooed by kevin but he's not here right now can you do a tattoo for me yeah i can well this is the price we got okay yeah well here's the thing i know that's the price but i need you to understand i tip really good mm. you know and a little <laughs> wink wink nudge nudge yeah and you're like oh so kevin's been taking payments outside of the confines of our agreement mm. is what you can inference real quick you know is like and the person that that really screws the only person that screws is the boss it doesn't mm. and it's not showing any respect to him but because it doesn't help you you don't make more money as an artist you might mm -hmm. be able to talk somebody to get into a piece that you want more that they couldn't afford so and you you the person who gets the most of it is the client because then mm. he has the lower price but of course he can't get you to back up his work and when he comes back in years later to get more work from you and you're no longer there then your boss mm. finds out and then he tells everybody kevin shouldn't be hired because he's a piece of shit you know it goes mm. yeah or I kevin ends up in the spot that he hires like him. I have a healthy base for like respecting my mentors just from performing, you know, like I'm someone who needs mm -hmm. a mentor, you know, in my whole career I've needed, I've needed someone to bounce off who's had more experience than me and always respected opinions and, and, uh, and taken on what they tell me and implemented things, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, I'm totally, totally the right person for, for I believe not, that... not making that mistake. That, I believe that pays off in the longest run of it because of mm -hmm. that, because eventually you find yourself where you're like, I need to make money off of other people's work and I need to be mm -hmm. able to find something I provide. I've learned mm -hmm. how to manage a shop and I'm old as fuck and I can't draw anymore. I got shaky hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm relying on these kids to work for me. But if you spent your karma formative years ripping off your mentors or screwing them mm -hmm. over, that's just going to happen to you in the, you yeah. know, in the yeah. future, my imagination. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a cycle, hey. I bet you see that also, though, inside of um, there, there's those people that were probably not as respectful to those that come before. 
Yeah. And I imagine they probably didn't last long or didn't find themselves as accepted and eventually found themselves working as Walmart, you know, greeters. You know, I like to, I like to explain to performers who are, you know, if they might be doing someone else's bit or ripping off someone else's joke or ripping off someone else's routine, I'd say it's a hurdle. You, you, you're giving yourself, you know, if you're running a race, a performer who, who adds their own flavor and tries their own thing is going to have a straight run to the finish line. A performer who, who uses old, old jokes and old routines and steals bits from other pieces is just putting like 10 or 20 hurdles in front of themselves before the finish line. I got and, a good uh, example of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Carlos Mencia from The Mind of Mencia, old TV yeah, show that yeah, was yeah. carried on Comedy Central. I but um, he was stealing jokes from yeah. uh, Ari Fle- Fleischman or Shafir? something. All right. Shafir, yep. Uh, the Amazing Racist was one of his old mm-hmm. monitors, Ari. Uh, he's one of Joe Rogan's friends. And then Joe yeah. Rogan kind of put him on blast um, on a video on where he called him out. Yeah. 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 And then that went kind of viral or whatnot for whatever viral was back then. And the next thing we knew, Mind of Mencia wasn't around. He had a hurdle that he put in yeah. front of himself. He's like, exactly. I can't get too famous because people will see me using stolen jokes. And mm-hmm. then I'm then they'll know the gigs up. Yeah. So it's it's the same, you know, in, in street performing and any kind of performing, really. You and in tattooing, you take on you can be influenced and inspired by people, but you got to add you. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that goes for all, all kind of arts, you know, performing arts, visual arts, everything. Seems um, to be. We on the floor? What do you think are the most saturated uh, on that topic? What are the most saturated of tattoo styles? What's, what, what's there too mm-hmm. much of? I don't think there's too much of any of it, I guess, you know, because you kind mm-hmm. of eventually you create your own clientele. And so as long as you're working, I can't really make the determination that there's too much. Mm. I see a lot of black and gray. I think Mm -hmm. it's just beautiful. I think it stands the test of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't care as much for color portraits or color realism, although they're Mm -hmm. fucking gorgeous. The technical ability that it takes to apply them and that I see being done by people like Nico Hurtado, Steve Butcher and, uh, Mm -hmm. and Cody Reed, uh and halo even mm. some of my the people that i love their work but i just don't care it, it, it leaves me flat at one point just because if you can have that much of an emotional pull over mm. a movie to put it on your body and it's not you know like uh one flew over the cuckoo's nest yeah. you know <laughs> then what i don't know if it's not the one that i like <laughs> then yeah. i don't know i lose interest right like oh yeah, that's cool yeah, yeah. Uh, you're a big fan of Bruce Lee. That's super dope. However, <laughs> man. you know, on, um, on that, let me answer the one that I don't think I see enough of. And I bet it would be something yeah. that you would like too, because the RA, the way that your own tattoos are and the kind of styles, I don't see enough, in my opinion, of organic or even, um, even just black work done, yeah. not for the purpose of conveying a story, but allowing the, the wearer to convey the story it just accentuates Mm -hmm. the the musculature and the body and makes them the focus as Mm -hmm. opposed to look at i got bruce lee here bruce lee's the focus you know that's funny you say that because uh a lot of the times with my tattoos i draw them and i take them to the artist and i say can you put this here because it fits on my shoulder you know Mm -hmm. i can you put this here because it goes with the run of my leg like, uh, and, and I say 90% of my tattoos, I drew myself and I took to the artist and had them, had them do it. And I, I think only my biceps, uh, I had the artist draw it on with a Sharpie and then do it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's really important is, uh, is, is using someone's body as a, as a canvas and using mm-hmm. the shapes to, to use, to, to make the tattoo look cool, you know? Yeah. I, I I see some that are done with that thought of all different genre, you know, genres of tattooing, including realism. But mm. I, I I like it, or I I don't see as much of it being done that doesn't still have a more important purpose to convey, or or that's what I read mm. it as. It's like 
uh, you know, here's this well shaped out piece. It goes mm. across the arm from the back of the shoulder to the bicep or something. It shows size, it has some opening, and it's allowed to breathe, but it is also a Viking or mm. an owl. You know, it's got to yeah. be a subject. And I'm not saying that that's, that's definitely a guy's place. Just I think we see less of the abstract anymore. Mm. Like there was tribal back in the day. Yeah. And that was very abstract. And, and mm. it did fit the body in ways or it attempted to. But mm -hmm. we don't like see the Samoan his... style. Yes, that and, and the geometric stuff that people are doing now. I'm seeing more of that. That stuff uh, usually does fit the body and make it move. I love that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I see that a lot with the, uh, the like the full torso black work. You know, it looks cool on the body. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what what it's what it means. You know, I've right. got a, a standard reply when someone asks me what my tattoos mean. Say it. It means I look good naked. Yes, yes. That's what that should be the objective of all your tat. That or that's that's something that I apply in my mm. idea of all my application of tattoos. And it's probably the number one thing for me is I was thinking about how does this flow with every other part of the body and yeah. does it move right? And sometimes that will hold me back from having maybe a better piece. Mm -hmm. I'll say probably 90% of the time it does <laughs> because yeah. if I just worried about my Instagram picture, then I could do, you know, what everybody's doing and just have this cool piece. But it seems more important to me since we are working on people. Cause otherwise, if you're just going to do the cool piece, it seems like it's good on a canvas, put it on a sticker or a t-shirt and sell that bitch. Mm -hmm. But if it's going on a person, like look at the overall. And the body all part. That. Yeah. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. that. That's cool because uh, I mean that's that's how I wear them, so that makes sense mm -hmm. to me how I do them. You know. Yeah, that's I cool. think uh, some some of them that I see that they go good, especially on um, on the body, is some that would be segmented, say over a muscle belly, like a bicep that contracts. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as it's segmented over that, and then it contracts, those segments get smaller. As it yeah. gets bigger, those segments appear bigger. And then that gives me an idea of size and movement too, if you follow. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like those kinds of things can apply everywhere on the body, including, uh, you know, on, on a girl's ass or whatever, like you can show the right shapes. If you want, you can try to narrow something up from a round booty. You can try and narrow up into a waistline and then spread back out on the shoulders. And now mm -hmm. if this girl just loves ice cream and not working out, she still has this <laughs> ratio right yeah. that's applied to um then there's a scientific ratio that, that that men find attractive to the shoulders uh mm -hmm. hips or and to the waist and, and, and portions that, yeah yeah if you apply that to the tattoo and keep the movement going then you know you don't have to go to the gym as much mm. some of the idea or if you do huh. go to the gym you're really going to accentuate it i like that yeah that's cool that's good for yeah. me Just look better yeah. naked we look better naked for sure. So, um, well, what would you say? How would you feel about learning to tattoo from a mentor remotely? It's interesting. Are you considering it? <laughs> um, well, I know people that's doing the thing it. is like there's mm -hmm. there's obviously tattoo shops around here, but everyone that I know is kind of not around here. Right. You know. I think it's especially in your case. I think you're possibly better suited. I just don't want to give an endor an uh, over an endorsement on all the online courses that people are offering right now. Right. But I do know of um, like, I think it can be, I, I can't really see why it couldn't be done. One yeah. with the right cameras and videos, you can record your hand motions progress. Yeah. And show that to your mentor who's wherever it's, mm -hmm. it would be more about, I think you would want to manage and make sure that your mentor has that time set aside because mm -hmm. the idea you're just like, Oh yeah, sure. I can do that anytime. No, you can't. Not if you're tattooing. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but you could possibly be able to record your work yourself and then send it to him that you'd be doing on practice skins and stuff mm -hmm. and send it to him. So he could watch the way that your hand movement, and then he could write you detailed emails, even if there's different, time change you know what i mean mm -hmm. where you're like yeah you're moving a little fast you're moving a little slow your mm -hmm. machine's not moving fast enough it's you know whatever it might be 
And uh, eventually you could probably learn that on skin that way too. I would imagine it'd be better if they had the time set aside and they're like, okay, no, yeah. from six o'clock to eight o'clock, I'm going to be watching Alec Kazam do a tattoo. So I don't want to mm. schedule anything on that. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. That's cool. Um, so what's, uh, tell me, what's the worst part about being a tattooer? Uh, uh, lack of inspiration probably, huh? Mm. And dealing with the thing you love so closely, you love mm. people and you fucking hate them. Right. So <laughs> Like, uh, you'll probably find that you're like, man, the crowd control is really cool. Controlling one person sometimes mm. much harder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, well the opposite question. What's the best part about being a tattooer? People. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Same answer. Yeah. When you really, you know, connect with people and you're assured of, uh, good things in your world because you see positive cool people like-minded or or even you know just i don't know something about the interaction if it wasn't for tattooing i would i wouldn't get out nearly as much i wouldn't i feel i understand your need to entertain because mm -hmm. i have a need that is satisfied of communal environment through tattooing but if i don't mm -hmm. have that to offer i don't want to be there Mm. Yeah, we, we went on a cruise and I, I don't know how I would react being on a cruise and not being able to work right yeah so, I see I, I, I wouldn't want to go to a festival where I wasn't invited to perform That's I get you you know mm -hmm. yeah I'd hate to see my friends just killing it and then I'm not next you know what I mean I'd be like mm -hmm. god damn it I Candy just here. reminded me of something I say all the time for that. Uh, I get a captive audience under the threat of pain. That seems to be something mm. I find unique. Like I can make it. Hey, you're going to laugh. No, you're going to laugh, motherfucker. You're going to laugh <laughs> or you feel the needle again. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. Yeah. You go a little deeper. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I think I often think of myself as a, as a, um, as a poor comedian and, mm -hmm. uh, so when I'm doing a tattoo, I have an audience of one. And what I've learned lately, I don't know if some people are getting madder about it or not, is I put on music and but that makes me sing. Mm. So now they got to deal with me singing my hot stink breath mm -hmm. in their face, <laughs> messing up lyrics to songs they can't even hear. Yeah. Uh, but the other is they got to listen to me talk about all kinds of shit, trying to craft jokes. The, the, after I got it worked out, I get up and I'll go down the road and I'll try and I'll work it on, uh, like say Dale, you know, <laughs> or try, try Emily next. Be like, yeah, check this out. I was thinking. Nice. Um, okay. So how, how do you think tattooing will change in the next 10 years? Uh, people tell me I'm crazy, but we're going to have computers doing it. So we're going to have computers judging us, acting as our lawyers and doing our tattoos. And really? You think like a robot can do a tattoo? Robot, dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I've watched sure. the technical, um, the tools to technically apply the tattoo improve greatly in a shorter amount of time mm. than... I've noticed uh, that, too. Yeah, because like as soon as rotaries came out, those rotaries started to have uh, advancements technologically from each progression more mm -hmm. quickly than the old coil machine did. Mm -hmm. it was kind of tried and true nothing really changed a few little different changes here and there were usually shot down by the status quo community or something on the coil mm -hmm. machine but because the rotary was new it was free it wasn't you didn't have to um be held to the you know design applications of, mm. of the old and so i've seen that get better and better and they're now they're making these machines that can sense the resistance that they're receiving mm. and then intuitive and compensate for it. That's why some of the line work is getting so much better with these things. Mm. However, I don't think so. Eventually, I see, and, and we have razors already, right? So there's a razor that can sense also um, the depth it's cutting and uh, mm -hmm. the resistance and adjust the motors as needed for the same thing. So I'm betting mm -hmm. we're going to have. So once that is then applied to a tattoo, sure, I'm putting it in, but the computer is sensing the skin and putting the right amount of stitches or points in the skin. 
And then how mm-hmm. much further are we along from having your arm in a sleeve and having a computer do it without any mistakes? Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, is that what people want? I don't know, I guess. Uh, well, I would have said no. And I said no for the longest time until I started to see the AI artwork. And right. they have an ability with the chat GBT or whatever, where they'll yeah. say a regurgitation of every stupid fucking idea they had in their head. And they'll yeah. be like, here's my idea. And as a tattoo artist, you hear it and you're like, all right, we're going to knock about three of those things out of there. And it's going to be too, too many, but that's yeah. going to be our compromise. And yeah. then you yeah. start, but then you see chat PT, they put it together and he's like, okay, I see it. That looks awesome too. Fuck. <laughs> Shit. All right. Well, fuck it. I guess the robots are going to be doing tattoos. But so, uh, I, I think th- there will still be a, a lot of necessity. People will yearn for uniqueness at that point, and people will still want the touch of a human. There will be a big debate mm-hmm. going back and forth about mm-hmm. which is better. But as robots begin to represent the lar- a larger part of our daily day, you know, where we start mm-hmm. trusting them for decisions like being a judge at a court case or being a lawyer at a court case. Mm. then I can see, you know, we're all going to be walking around Neuralinks and shit anyways, right? Right. So, like, at that point, I can see people like, yeah, I'm fucking, I got a robot in my brain helping me do shit. Like, like fucking Iron Man. There's a write-up when I see people, you know, of their fucking uh, criminal history or something. I don't know. But then why wouldn't I then trust a, a computer to also do my tattoo? Mm. And then my subsequent so, laser removal with the with the computer and my tattoo I get the next day. Right. Are people coming in with uh, like AI art and saying, can I get this? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. But I, I tell the future in uh, what, 10 to 20 year segments. So mm, mm. this is this is within 20 years. I see uh, computers easily right. having the ability to do tattoos and, well, and good, people will I'm, be using them. I'm 45 this year. And, uh, yeah. you know, retirement age is, is 65. So yeah, maybe I guess it's 65. I'll no problem. Yeah. I think, and, and there'll be a big, I mean, I think there's still going to be room obviously for artists that establish themselves because many mm. people are going to look down on the, um, the new AI art, even mm-hmm. if they can't tell it is, there will be AI art that is working its ass off to put mistakes in. Like I might possibly make in a tattoo just so it mm. isn't recognized as AI art. Right. <laughs> and then, Crazy. and then, yeah, because people will have a status. On, I'm sure they'll be like, well, that's cheaper, you know, for sure to get AI art is going to be cheaper once I yeah, build yeah. a machine. I mean, it'll be priced right in there to where then they start to control the price, but, probably two to three times as much is going to be a, a person doing the tattoo itself. Mm-hmm. Crazy. All right. Maybe. Final question. We'll see. Hopefully I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Who's your favorite tattooer? Like right now or ever uh, or both. I guess it would be Jack Rudy. Man, isn't Jack my Rudy. favorite. He's pretty fucking awesome, man. Yeah. He talks a lot and uh, he says what's on his mind. He, he really brought, portrait tattooing to another level and he he once had a quote that i just love he said uh, everybody else they were they're putting these different quotes on people's artwork that they had did for a uh, calendar and mm-hmm. so somebody's beautiful artwork would be up and then they would say something like i love switching the reality of people and making them float upside down in a world of my creating or some shit you know whatever <laughs> um whatever that they were passionate about, you know? And it finally yeah. came to Jack Rudy's and it said, uh, if you're looking for me, I'm not there. I'll show up soon enough. Be well worth the wait. Nice. I like that. Yeah. I loved it. It was like, all right, yeah, that's. This, I feel like the stars are uh, <laughs> aligning here, you know, because uh, my mentor as a street performer, I don't know if you know this, but uh, mm-hmm. my mentor was Lucky Diamond Rich, who happens to be the most tattooed man in the world. Guinness okay. record holder. You know Jack Lucky Rich? I heard you interview him. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. On the podcast. I listened to that. Yeah. He's he's uh his whole body is tattooed black now at this point. Am I wrong? Because he's yeah, had two he, or he three bodysuits. He had to go a hundred percent like a hundred percent black before uh he could get the record for the world's most tattooed man. And you know, that was over ten years ago. And since then he's been getting all kinds of you know, white and color tattoos over the top 
but uh-huh. he remains the world's most tattooed man and he happens to be an incredible street performer who was um who got a start maybe 10 years before me so mm-hmm. when he when he um when i when i was just starting out he was like the top gun you know and he was my mentor in the beginning and he's been my mentor throughout my career and you know now that i'm in the tattoo world and thinking about tattooing it just kind of feels like it feels like the stars are aligning, like I'm doing the right thing. I'm in the right place. <laughs> I would imagine. I think anytime yeah. anybody, I think this whole podcast is the one thing that I found to look for and try and excite listeners about. And that's mm. about passion. I mean, the the, the bed, uh, the chair, the the wall, the everything in our life that is man-made it is, uh, it, it's made here because of somebody's passion. Sure. Mm. Th- there was, I mean, it was thought. But even as thought, it didn't turn to shit until mm-hmm. somebody put passion with it. And that passion then excited the ambition and the desire to learn how uh, the technical pieces and then put it together and then everything exists. And so I feel the same. If you're going after your passion, you're far going to be more rewarded, both monetarily and just with happiness than if you were going after anything else. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's definitely where it started for me with performing. It was just the draw of, you know, using something that I learned at home to entertain, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and the, the passion behind it is, is um, you know, it's, it's basically it's basically love. I just I want more love mm-hmm. from the crowd. And that's that's my passion, really. Um, I'm interested. Yeah. I'm looking forward to having you back on here in a year or two. And see how nice. uh, the dynamic changes of of tattooing. You know what I mean? Because now this one on personal relationship that you'll be having with the clients, I'm wondering if you'll be missing the uh, the almost more distant but larger number of people, or mm. if you'll be like, no, this is really satisfying because we sit down, we have a good conversation. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I learn about new things. My narrow viewpoint is challenged and I come away a smarter and a, a sharper individual. Yeah. I like that. I definitely like, uh, I like being challenged and I like learning new things. So <laughs> it seems like okay. uh, like a good fit for me. Well, um, I, hopefully you'll be getting some people that want to help you. I, I, yeah. do, I already do. So one, we can start there. And then the other is, well, you've we already helped start me, bro. Just putting people them questions. in your chair. Right. Yeah, on. Well, then it. come on with 12 sometime. And <laughs> with nice. that though, brother, I think I've stayed too long and I've educated too much somewhere. There is a kid at home that is as foolish as me and he is putting together a Walkman and he's getting some Indian ink and he is going to try and make a mistake so that he can follow down the career or the, the pursuit of passion. <laughs> Just like nice. my dumbass did so many years ago. Hey, but kid, while you're doing it, use sterile equipment. That's what I'm just saying. Learn, learn to boil, <laughs> go online, get some single use stuff. Wear some gloves. Yeah, don't worry, mate. Yeah, I'm going to do it for, I'll do it legit. <laughs> All right. Thanks so cool, much, mate. brother. Thanks a lot. No problem. We'll talk to you again soon. Oh, no, you know what? I didn't do any of this. We already got your shirts out there, but any contact information, any Instagram stuff that we should follow? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my show Instagram is Alakazam Show. And also that's the website, alakazamshow.com. And um, I'm still using my Freak original Instagram uh, for my Freak stuff, but I'm also starting to uh, post art on there as well. Um, just to kind of awesome. tie it in with what I'm doing right now. So we can um, we can get on there and comment and tell you how shitty or, or how good it looks. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. Freak dot original. Uh, that's my Instagram handle for my freak stuff and my and my drawings and that. So and uh, Alakazam show for my show. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for being a part of this, Al. We'll All see right, you on brother. the road. Thank you. No problem. Later. Bye.